everyone. Hey, Dr. Bookfar. Good morning, Randy, Josh, Greg, great talk. Absolutely. Um, we talked about it a little bit the other day too, but uh, it's fantastic. Really changed the way I kind of practice, so. Um, so today it's the Neuro-Oncology Tumor Board session, or the tumor uh, case conference. And I wanted to discuss low-grade gliomas. Um, we've heard a little bit about high-grade gliomas with Dr. Bookbar previously, as well as some of the research going into it. But uh, high-grade gliomas, glioblastoma in particular, is not the only disease process, uh, not the only primary brain tumor that can happen. So just give me a second. I'm going to share my screen. We'll talk a little bit about this and show some video. How's everyone doing? It's, I feel like I don't get to um, associate with you guys all the time. Is our chat still running, Josh, or you shut it down for a minute? It's open. It's open. Just a reminder today, we also have um, the cardiology series next. And then today, tumor talk will actually be postponed till next week. We're taking a week off just for peace of mind. Jacob next week said, we're... What's, what's cooking good looking? <laughs> yeah, I think he was talking to you, but. Your videos are not mine. <laughs> All right. The brain turns motto. Can everyone see my screen? Josh, you got it? Yep. It's all good. All right, great. Yes. Excellent. All right. So low gray gliomas here. Let me pull up the chat too. We can actually we can leave it running if you guys want. I'm not Josh can always chime in and tell me some questions and answers. Sounds good. All right, so low-grade gliomas. So the main thing here is that uh, they're part of the bigger umbrella or the bigger spectrum of astrocytomas. There are something called the oligodendrogliomas too. We're not going to focus too much on that, but I'll make a few mentions to it. And astrocytomas in general are the most common intraaxial brain tumor. When we talk about brain tumors, we talk about intraaxial or extraaxial, right? Extraaxial meaning outside of the brain itself, and intraaxial meaning it, it develops within the brain. And these things uh, are ultimately rare. You know, five in 100,000 people are about 16,000 cases a year. And that's total astrocytomas, including malignant um, tumors as well. And uh, I just put this in there just because I think it, it matters to some people. It's not yet associated with cell phone use. So don't, don't freak out too much. Um, but the truth is, is that we don't have the data for people with longer than 15, 20 year exposure. So that, that'll be important information down the road. People now issued, a, they did issue a warning um, and that's it but don't freak out. Uh, the epidemiology is important to understand. We talked a little bit about it on the last slide, but astrocytomas are lower grade astrocytomas. We'll talk about the grading system soon. Primarily affect children and young adults. Um, when you see them in older people, it, it means you know, a worse prognosis. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. Most common presentation, because they're very slow growing, is seizures actually. Uh, and the reason for that is not only where they arise, but how they grow. These are diffusely infiltrative tumors that, you know, a tumor cell transforms and it infiltrates a normal brain. And so there's actually typically tumor and normal brain coexisting. And there's some studies that show that seizures actually uh, can facilitate growth of these tumors and play into the kind of natural environment that the tumors exist in. They have a strange predilection for whatever reason in terms of the temporal lobe, uh, posterior frontal lobe or anterior parietal lobes. And you can imagine this makes things difficult because these are typically eloquent regions, especially on the dominant temporal lobe or in the posterior frontal anterior parietal lobes. That's where our primary motor and primary sensory cortex is. And so we'll get into a little bit about how that changes how we treat these. So the, I mentioned before the classification and the grading system. So we typically describe low-grade gliomas as either circumscribed or diffusely infiltrative or heterogeneous in, in their presentation. And we follow the World Health Organization grading system. And this has changed over the past 10 years. Uh, the most recent system uses not just histological markers, meaning that the pathologist looks under a microscope and looks at the actual imaging characteristics of what the cells and their, you know, the, the, micro, uh, the micro environment looks like. But now we also use molecular markers. And this has changed a lot, number one, as science has gotten better, but also it changes how we treat uh, tumors in general. And so, WHO grade one is how we'll talk about a lot of things. These are, you know, these are your benign gliomas, okay? Uh, juvenile pilocytic astrocytomas, uh, subependymal giant cell astrocytomas, desmoplastic, polymyxoid. You know, these are, again, names given based on the, 
histology and the molecular features. Um, but in general, when you surgically remove a WHO grade one tumor, you've cured that patient. Uh, similarly, you can watch these for a long time and they only really need to come out if they're causing symptoms or to establish a diagnosis because a lot of times we don't know what the actual finding on the MRI is, right? MRI can't tell you a diagnosis. It just tells you what's there. WHO grade two is what we're really focusing this lecture on. And these typically involve some sort of cellular atypia. And what that means is when a pathologist looks at the cells, they don't look healthy. There's something abnormal, whether it's the shape or increased mitoses or whatnot. Um, this includes our astrocytomas, the oligodendrogliomas, which until recently, uh, this was a histologic finding. Um, they looked different under the microscope. Nowadays, they've made the uh, grading of this very strict. And so you need specific codeletions, the 1P19Q codeletion, those are chromosomal abnormalities, and they need to be IDH mutated. And we'll talk a little bit about IDH a little bit later as well. All right. Pleomorphic xanthoastrocytomas are extremely rare, more kind of a novelty in terms of tumor type. Same thing with gemistocytics. The main thing about these is that the P53 mutations are common here, and we'll talk about what that means as well. Grade three and grade four gliomas, uh, we've kind of covered already with Dr. Bookfar. So these are anaplastic astrocytomas, oligodendrogliomas, and our glioblastoma. And we obviously know that glioblastoma is a huge problem. And I have this little blue arrow at the bottom of the screen here to show you that these things exist upon a gradient, all right? So it's not just that you get diagnosed with a grade two astrocytoma and that's your diagnosis. It actually means that there's a risk of these tumors de-differentiating and becoming higher grade tumors. And that's where things get dangerous. So the histologic features that affect grade when you look under the microscope, this has to do with how many cells you see, the presence or absence of giant cells, anaplastic cells, which I told you, anaplastic, uh, atypia, kind of mean the same thing in terms of the cells don't look normal. And then mitoses, uh, how, how rapidly cells are dividing. We have a bunch of different markers for that. And then vascular proliferation and necrosis, typically more associated with the higher grade tumors, okay? The background of this slide is actually a glioblastoma. And there's a few features here that are very, very characteristic. Number one, the cellularity. It's very, very cellular. This area up here, I don't know if you can, you can see my mouse moving. This area here that's acellular, but surrounded by cells, is actually necrosis. So this is just dead tissue, dead cells, basically, and cell material. And see how the cells kind of align around it? This is something called pseudopalisading necrosis. And that is a uh, pathognomonic uh, pathologic find or histopathologic find, uh, finding for glioblastoma. These red things here are called glomeruloid um, blood vessels. And it's just basically vascular uh, proliferation. They, they, they grow so fast, they're very irregular. The blood-brain barrier doesn't work in these areas. And they look like uh, glomeruloid from the kidneys, actually. And that's where they get the terminology from. So prognostic factors for these things. What makes lower grade tumors dangerous? So presentations with increased intracranial pressure. Now this can happen because these things grow extremely slowly. And over time, your brain compensates. It shifts its function to different areas of the brain. And you, know, you don't get the headaches you would get with an acute brain bleed. So this is a slow, progressive process. And so if the pressure basically reaches a tipping point that it's causing symptoms, usually a bad sign. Altered consciousness has something to do with where the tumor is for the most part. Personality changes similarly. Uh, any sort of significant deficit. So again, posterior frontal, anterior parietal, these are critical eloquent areas, right? Posterior frontal is where your motor strip is. So someone who arrives and no longer can move the right side of their body or their leg or their arm has to do with your functional status. And in cancer, all cancer, functional status really matters, okay? The better you are before a surgery or before your treatment, the better you're gonna do. Uh, and that's just something that holds true. In neurosurgery, we use something called the Karnofsky performance status, which has to do with basically how well you're able to live life independently, all right? And then the shorter the duration of symptoms prior to a diagnosis, you can imagine, this has to do with the fact that something's changing rapidly. And whenever things change rapidly, they're a little more dangerous. And then contrast enhancement on MRI is usually a, a harbinger of a higher grade. So the minute you start getting leaky blood vessels, with, which is how contrast works in an MRI, it typically means that the tumor has changed or is changing. Now, again, I mentioned this before, and this is a key thing to understand. These are low cellularity tumors and they preserve normal brain. So they're infiltrating. Um, a good analogy is 
sort of uh, you know spaghetti with meatballs and and tomato sauce, right? You can remove all the meatballs from the spaghetti, but imagine you had to take all the pasta sauce out. It's it's virtually impossible. And so these these tumor cells have kind of wrapped around all your normal structures, and they're all still there. Maybe I'm hungry. Uh, anyway, so de-differentiation, we talked about this a little bit. So typically your age does matter a lot here, all right? And so if you're under 45 years old and you have a lower grade astrocytoma, the mean, and you know, there's, there's obviously uh, plus or minus on the end of this, but the mean time is about three and a half years and the time to death is around five years. That actually probably is, is up to eight to 10 years for a grade two. Um, more reasonably. But again, if you reach that 45 year mark, all of a sudden your numbers change a lot. And that's just because typically the older you are, the more likely you are to progress to a higher grade tumor. And that's a pretty significant thing. Now, obviously we're obsessed with glioblastoma right now because, you know, after a hundred years of neurosurgery, the mean survival is still only about 15 months. But here's a tumor now where you can buy someone eight to 10 years life. And these tumors need attention also from the research end of things. We have to be able to treat these things. Uh, they're affecting 35-year-olds, 32-year-olds, you know, with children, young children. And so these are devastating diseases. Um, and although it's manageable uh, and you can treat it sort of as a chronic disease, it, it really needs the, the focus of, of neurosurgeons and neuro-oncologists and researchers alike to get to the bottom of this. Now, the molecular features I talked about a little bit. Um, so P53 mutations, very common in astrocytoma, it's about 60%. Typically, when you see these mutations, it means a more aggressive tumor, all right? And this has to do, P53 is involved in, in many different cancer cells. IDH muta mutations, um, which are, you know, more likely in these lower-grade astrocytomas, 60 to 90% of what we call a secondary glioma, meaning that um, it's a glioma that starts low-grade and progresses to high-grade versus a tumor that just starts immediately as a high-grade tumor. All right. This mutation is important and actually part of the Krebs cycle. So anyone going through uh, orgo or you know, bio has heard of this. Uh, it's a little-known enzyme. But basically, the mutation reduces the enzyme's ability to bind isocitrate, which is its substrate. That converts alpha-ketoglutarate, which you can see here, uh, and usually produces CO2, but then replenishes NADH and NADPH. So with reduced you know, binding, you're getting less of those things. The mutations have, it turns out, when you have an IDH mutation, you have better overall survival, better progression pre survival, and better chemo sensitivity, meaning you respond better to the chemo uh, therapies. And so, overall, a better prognosis. And so, this is something that's really come about in probably the past 10 years or so and plays a big role in our decision of how we're going to treat these patients, um, what treatment options are available. And then, MGMT promoter methylation has to do with. Basically, um, the tumor's response to temozolomide, which is our key chemotherapy for glioblastoma at this point. Uh, that's the drug that showed the, the best prolongation of overall survival when being treated. All right. So radiographic features, we start looking at how do we tell the difference? How do you know if someone has a low grade or a high grade? And the truth is you really don't until you do, um, until you get tissue, right? Uh, and so you can take some guesses though. And so we get a CT scan. CT scans, these look like hypodense lesions, right? I think I've talked to some, some groups about CT scans. CT scans measure density. So water is not very dense, whereas bone is, right? And air is the least dense. So on a CT scan, the air surrounding the, the skull is black, pitch black. And that's the most hypodense structure. The um, bone itself is the most dense structure, typically anyway. And that's extremely white. And so then you can window it and play around with it. So these things would show up as hypodense because they're typically, um, you know, slightly edematous. They've got more fluid in them and they're not as, uh, they're not as, you know, they don't look like normal brain. They obviously don't look like bleeding or anything like that. MRI is still the, you know, the gold standard for diagnosis, for radiographic diagnosis anyway. And on an MRI, you would look at the T2 um, weighted image and you would see hyperintensity. So that's best seen, uh, this is a T2 right here. And so this, I mean, you're always looking for asymmetry, right? You can see the differences here. This would be a classic low-grade glioma appearance on a T2 weighted image. Then we look for contrast enhancement or the lack thereof, right? So this is a T1 weighted MRI image, which is used best to look at normal anatomy 
and you see it's hypo intense. When we talk about MRI, we talk about intensity, not density. All right. And then this image over here is a T1 based image, but they've injected gadolinium or a contrast agent. And what you see is the primary, the, the majority of the tumor is non enhancing. So if this was a glioblastoma, you would see typically a rind of enhancing tissue all the way around it. Here, there might be some enhancement. It could also be blood vessels because blood vessels obviously carry contrast. That could be enhancing a little bit as well. But this is a very large uh, right frontal low-grade glioma and very classic for it. But the image above, you can see here, again, this is a flare image. So a flare image is a T2-based image, but they've subtracted out the cerebrospinal fluid, so it looks black. But um, this is the best image to look at edema or water. And so you can see this is a large, you know, heterogeneously non-enhancing flare positive lesion. Um, with, you can see here, it's actually a different intensity than here. So there's a, two components to this. And then again, no contrast enhancement on the contrast scan at all, all right? So that's basically the radiograph. That's the majority of what we look at for radiographic images. Sometimes we can do something called spectroscopy, which is an MR, uh, um, it's a MRI technique that looks at basically metabolism of, of the uh, lesion that you're looking at. And so in tumors, you'll see increased metabolism, increased you know, cell turnover, things that suggest a tumor versus an infection, which is gonna look different, all right? And so based on this image, we have to make a decision, right? And the decision is, you know, do we watch this lesion because it's slow growing? Do we take it out? Do we treat it presumptively? You know, and we don't have a diagnosis. Again, an MRI is not enough to make a diagnosis. So it becomes a tough decision. So what are our treatments again? So nothing, we can just watch, all right? And some people opt to do this. In the past, this was a reasonable choice. And what you would do is you would wait until someone showed some sign of progression, um, either growing on an MRI or they develop seizures, they, they develop weakness, personality changes, those things before. More and more, I think neurosurgeons are getting away from this. And this is because there's really, really solid evidence now that suggests that taking out as much of this as you can, and in some cases, even more than just the tumor, is going to benefit overall survival, um, progression-free survival, meaning that living life before the tumor comes back or grows, and seizure freedom, quality of life. And so more and more, especially as we've gotten better at both diagnosis, understanding how treatments vary based on molecular characteristics and our surgical adjuncts, which I'll talk a little bit about too, we've kind of got more aggressive about treating this. All right, radiation and chemotherapy, at this point, saved for progression or for untreatable lesions, lesions that are in regions you really can't go after. And that happens in the brainstem. Uh, it happens in the thalamus, happens in the basal ganglia. Uh, and so regions like this happens in language areas where you can't resect it. And so this is something that, you know, we still don't have good answers to. Um, and there's no great, you know, recommendation that we can follow. So there's still an art here of how we're going to treat each individual patient. All right. The surgery itself, the key here is, again, I talked about the benefits for the most part. One of the big things is that these tumors, it's important to understand this. It's not a clone, okay? So there, it's not just one cell that's replicating, replicating, replicating. All the cells are different and they're pulling in features of the environment, blood vessels, you know, parasites, uh, immune cells, microglia, oligodendrocytes, uh, astrocytes, you know, neurons. All these cells are contributing. They're all being transformed uh, into part of the tumor. And so these tumors are very variable within themselves. And so when you biopsy one portion of a large tumor, it's different than a biopsy somewhere else in that tumor. And the aggressive nature of the tumor varies with that as well. And so these are extremely difficult uh, tumors to treat because you have to treat multiple different features of it, all right? Um, it's like little splinter cells from, a, from you know, some unnamed terrorist organization of some sort where you know, you can, you can take out the bulk of an issue here, but there's still little ses little cells in, that are gonna be different or, you know, non-responsive to your uh, chemotherapies and radiation and surgery. So the other thing we have to worry about is again, remember the, the analogy with the uh, spaghetti and meatballs, a, cl a complete resection here is not possible due to the way these tumors infiltrate. And I know we probably talked about it with glioblastoma, the majority of tumors recur within two centimeters of the initial resection cavity. Uh, they've looked at these, they've done studies on this, and actually at the time of you know, your first surgery, you can find tumor cells sometimes in the contralateral brain 
um, they migrate along white matter pathways. And so you don't just have the bulk of the tumor that's growing into your normal brain and causing problems, but the tumor itself is sending out little scouts throughout the brain. Uh, and that, you know, at this point, recurrence is the rule, all right? And so you have to, this is why research is so critically important in what we do. You can do the best surgery you can do, but you can't remove every single cell, but you can't treat every single cell, right? We just have to find the way and we, we're definitely not there yet. And so in the past, some people would actually just biopsy these and say, you know what? We know it's gonna grow for a really long time. We need a diagnosis because that will help us tailor treatment. And so they would do a needle biopsy. But a needle biopsy based on what we just talked about is not the best treatment for this because you really, you miss out on possibly the most aggressive part of this tumor. So let's say you have a tumor that looks classically like a grade two glioma, but there's one component of it deep in there that's a grade three. Now we treat grade three and grade two tumors very differently. And so now you're under treating someone and you're taking that you know, possible longevity that they can have and you're shortening it. And so you really need to be, uh, you need to really, I think, subscribe to the belief that surgery is the best thing for these. And then you have to figure out how you're gonna do it safely. And so more and more in the setting of low-grade tumors, we've gone to awake surgery or at least surgery where we can monitor, all right? Now, some of you may have seen the awake surgery that was on the Lenox Hill uh, Netflix documentary. Um, and that's, you know, very real. And I, I actually, I'm gonna try to find a video for a later session of uh, how we do awake surgery. But basically what you do is you, in an eloquent region where the best way to assess someone's neurologic function is to have them performing neurologically. So you keep the patient awake. Uh, you basically, well, I'm sorry, let me rephrase. You put the patient to sleep first. You make them extremely comfortable. You do your exposure. And then once the brain is exposed, you wake the patient up. So they actually don't feel any pain really. And the brain itself doesn't have nerve endings that feel pain. And so your skin feels a little bit of pain. The dura actually feels some pain, but the brain itself doesn't. And so you're exposed, they're awake, and then you want them to perform a task that is relevant to the location of your tumor. So you have to understand the anatomy. And that may be talking, all right? Language is an extremely complex neurologic function. And so typically we'll have them perform three or four different naming or reading tasks that involve different components of, of, um, of speech. And that way we can assess and make sure we're not compromising any function, okay? The other thing we sometimes have people do is wiggle their fingers or move their feet. Some of you may have seen the violin player the other day uh, or a couple months ago on, I think, YouTube or on the news. Um, and these are all things that have been done and they're all very possible as long as the patient's comfortable. And these are gonna facilitate getting a, a larger resection, okay? You can challenge these functions up to the, the limit, basically within a couple of millimeters and that function will be preserved. And that way you can do what's called maximize your extent of resection, all right? And it's been shown, large studies looking at awake surgeries, that a, a better gross total resection is possible with less weight severe deficits. So that's really important to know. So when we take someone for an, uh, an awake surgery, oftentimes they will wake up with a deficit. And that's because you really push the limits. That's what it lets you do. And as long as the monitoring stays connected, it means the transmissions are still going through, right? But due to manipulation of the tissue, you know, a little bit of inflammation, they still may wake up with some speech problems or some motor deficits, but these things typically get better. So when you look at the late severe deficits, meaning, meaning permanent injury to these people, it's less when you do awake surgery, all right? And some people have really pushed this to the absolute limit. Um, there's a guy in uh, Montpellier, France, his name's Hugh Defoe. He's written extensively on this. And uh, his contributions to neuroscience in general are incredible. Um, he's basically studied function of the brain and pathways of transmission within different regions of the brain by doing glioma surgery. And so not only does he contribute to treatment of patients with gliomas, but he's actually advanced neurology and neuroscience as a whole with his understanding of the different circuits. And his approach to this is actually, he will do, um, a, as much of a total resection as he can in an awake patient, preserving whatever is key to that region. But he'll actually leave a little bit of tumor and he'll come back a few years later, allowing the brain to reorganize some of its function. And you know the tumor you know, will continue to grow. Again, we can't get these all out, but typically with reorganization of those processes, he'll be able to go back in and remove more tumor at that point safely again. And so uh, he's got an incredible team. He uses neurocognitive rehab postoperatively. 
he gets patients, uh, you know, to reorganize their behaviors and their, and their function. And he goes back in and he continues to reoperate. And now he's doing up to three and four operations on these people. And based on his data, he's bringing low grade gliomas, which remember we talked about a mean survival of, you know, eight to 10 years. He's got people who are 20 years out. And so absolutely incredible. Now, I talked a little bit about radiation and chemotherapy. Uh, these things are not standardized in any way. A lot of times we're taking what we know about the molecular profile of these tumors. Uh, we're taking what happens just traditionally at an institution and we're putting, and we're putting that into the patient. Um, the goal here is to keep people alive as long as possible, obviously, but safely. So some trials say maybe they prolong progression-free survival, but I think all trials at this point have shown that it does not improve overall survival. And oftentimes there's really significant side effects. If you get whole brain radiation, you're at risk of cognitive deficits, which impairs your quality of life, right? And if you're gonna live eight to 10 years, but at four or five years, you're gonna develop severe cognitive dysfunction, you know, there's a, there's a, a trade-off there that's not necessarily worth it. Um, chemotherapy is typically initiated at this point for progression or recurrence, unless you're in Montpellier, France, and then you're getting another surgery. So how do we get better at resection? And this is something that I'm, I'm very interested in. A lot of my research has been on this in the past, um, both how do we get better at resection and how do we treat these tumors? But one of the things we use, or some of the things we use are different intraoperative adjuncts, right? And so we have these tools that allow us in the operating room, better spatial precision so we can understand it. Remember again, you're looking at a brain tumor that doesn't look very different from normal brain. And you have to decide um, you know, what's tumor and what's not. Uh, one of my trainee, one of my uh, mentors where I trained um, had a, a very important uh, piece of advice for neurosurgeons everywhere. And if you remember one thing from this lecture, all right, this is it. Everyone should get out a pen and write this down. All right. Brain good, tumor bad. That's it. So just remember that. But it's not as easy as it sounds, actually, because the tumor looks like the normal brain. And so we use all these different tools to get a better sense of it. So ultrasound, ultrasound is everywhere, right? When, when women are pregnant, use an ultrasound to see the baby. Sometimes you can use ultrasounds to put in IVs. It turns out using an ultrasound on the brain, you can actually see uh, with decent resolution, the anatomy, and these have gotten better. So here in the top right, you see this enhancing tumor right here uh, with a cystic component. And this is an ultrasound image, a coronal image of that tumor. And so it actually does help you. You can actually see hypercellularity where cellularity is, is greater. Uh, and it changes more diffuse over here. And so this unfortunately doesn't give you a cellular resolution, which you really would want to maximize your resection, but it does provide you the, the gross boundaries of your tumor. It tells you when there's some residual. They're now navigating these. And by navigation, I don't know if anyone's talked to you guys about this yet, but this system here is a brain lab system. There's different companies that make this. This uses surface registration off your scalp um, and basically allows us millimeter accuracy in the operating room, knowing where we are. It's a GPS system for the brain. So sometimes in surgery, you'll see someone put a wand down on the brain and that they're looking at a screen and that screen will tell you on the MRI exactly where you are. So that you can look at with your ultrasound as well and confirm that you're in the right place. Now, the problem with the navigation, since it's a surface registration, right, is the brain is sitting in, a, in fluid and it swells and it decompresses. And so within about two minutes of opening the skull, your registration is off, right? And so you're never as accurate as you are with the, with the, you know, with the skull closed, the skin on and everything like that. And so all of these things have issues, right? These are also expensive systems, ultrasound inexpensive, but you don't get the same ease of looking at your MRI where you can see what's enhancing and what's not, all right? Uh, intraoperative MRI is a big deal in neurosurgery. Um, people have shown its successes. It's exceedingly inexpensive. And it also adds about two hours to your case. Um, so not everyone has one, obviously. We don't use them everywhere. Um, I didn't have one during my training. We don't have one here, um, but we still get good resection. So the jury's still out. But it turns out that, imagine you're, you're doing your surgery and you get to a point where you're like, oh, you know what, I think I'm done. And then you just get an MRI right there and you bring them right, you, you don't even close the scalp, you just cover it and you come right back to the operating table and you can see in real time, you know what, there is a little more tumor right behind where we were, so let's go get it, all right? And this is, for, this is really if you believe in the extent of resection, which uh, at this point has become, I think, you know, tantamount to doing tumor surgery. Um, you know, this is a very valuable tool. 
And then the last thing we use, which is critical for low-grade gliomas, is the cortical and subcortical stimulation mapping, right? So this is awake surgery, and this is also using, you know, you can do this with an asleep patient, where you can monitor the motor evoke potential. So the signal that the motor strip sends to the rest of your body, you can monitor that. And you can know as you're approaching it based on how those potentials change, all right? And so what you see in this picture is actually, this is called an Ogemin stimulator. Ogemin was a famous neurosurgeon. And the little numbers are uh, identifying regions of the cortex that have function or don't have function. And that way you can identify a safe space where you can enter in and then debulk your tumor. All right. So this is one of my favorite things that we use nowadays. Uh, and this is absolutely incredible. So there's fluorescent dyes. Now I told you that navigation, the brain itself changes, you know, basically immediately upon opening the skull and you can look at your MRI, but your millimeter accuracy is gone, right? Because the brain has moved or you've resected some tumor and now things have changed. So these fluorescent dyes are specific to the tumor itself and it literally glows in the dark. And you can I, you basically paint by numbers to get it out. So there's two main dyes that people use, there's really three. Uh, 5-ALA right now has FDA approval for resection of gliomas, high-grade gliomas. And 5-ALA is metabolized within the tumor cells uh, due to some you know, dysregulation of some of their basic you know, normal functioning proteins, actually the heme uh, biosynthesis prep, uh, pathway. And one of the byproducts of administration of 5-ALA is something called protoporphyrin 9, which happens to be fluorescent. And so in malignant cells, protoporphyrin 9 accumulates due to you know, dysregulation of their normal function. And it fluoresces when shined with a certain wavelength of light, all right? And so the tumor itself glows red. It looks pink always, but it's actually red. And the normal brain does not. So you can differentiate where your tumor boundaries are. Brain shift no longer matters, which is a problem with navigation, right? This doesn't require two hours for your additional time and whatever, you know, $9 million for an intraoperative MRI. And it's, uh, you know, it's, this is the actual cells that glow in the dark, so you can actually follow them down. And so this has become really, uh, you know, it's almost ubiquitous for, for uh, academic centers to perform glioma surgery. Um, but the problem with 5-ALA is it's higher grade lesions only. So when we go to low grade lesions, even though some percentage of them do fluoresce, because of the fact that the, the tumor cells are infiltrating normal brain, we actually, uh, it dilutes the signal and you're unable to properly visualize it. The other dye that people use is something called sodium fluorescein. Sodium fluorescein has been used in neurosurgery since the 1940s. And that's a dye that works actually a lot like gadolinium for an MRI, so the contrast aging. So <clears throat> these tumors cause leaky blood vessels due to vascular you know, dysregulation. And large particles in these leaky blood vessels are able to seep out into the normal brain. All right, this is what John Bookbar does with his, uh, with his Enertroy Bio company where they open the blood brain barrier. And so these blood vessels are leaky and these large fluorescent compounds can leak out. And just like the MRI contrast, they, they uh, flow into the extracellular matrix there and they fluoresce a different color. Um, the nice thing about sodium fluorescein is you can operate with it glowing in the dark under you using a special microscope. With 5-ALA, you have to shift back and forth from a dark to a light screen. Now, they're working on digital overlays in this and augmented reality. The stuff that's coming down the road is absolutely incredible. So imagine, you know, you're looking at the normal brain and wearing, you know, goggles or looking through an exoscope or looking through a microscope, and there's a digital overlay of the fluorescence that's being read. So that now you're operating normally as you would, but with this, you know, fluorescent dye accumulating as well. And so unfortunately, though, right now for low-grade gliomas, we don't have an answer that for fluorescence. It's possible that targeted therapies down the road where you, you know, target a P53 mutation um, will work. But again, the heterogeneity of these tumors makes any sort of universal silver bullet, you know, virtually impossible. Um, and so this is how we do it. We use anatomy, we use navigation, we use ultrasound, and then we do awake surgery, right? And this is a typical awake setup. This is a strip electrode which monitors um, you know, recordings off the brain itself. This is the Ogeman stimulator, which he developed, again, the neurosurgeon for stimulating the brain and sending um, transmissions down through the you know, pathways. And this is obviously the left uh, temporal lobe, left frontal lobe here, and this is the sylvian fissure. And so this is the most common place you do awake surgery for the most part. The motor strip typically runs down here, right? Language areas, Broca's classic, even though we don't like to use that term anymore, would be here, 
all right? And then um, the, uh, the super marginal gyrus and Wernicke's area would be over here. And then in the white matter tracks is all the connections for speech, okay? And so typically we use recording for language, we use recording for motor, and then seizures, something called ECOG, where we can monitor reductions or increases in seizure activity in the brain while we operate. And that helps us for a lot of reasons. And so I wanted to show you guys this video. Uh, this video can actually be seen on the Lenox Hill YouTube page as well. But I think it's, uh, it's pretty good. Give me one second. Does anyone have any questions while this pulls up? Let's see. Uh, Deuce, hold on one second. Let me look at some questions before we show the video. Josh, anything good? What am I missing? Uh, there's a lot of questions. Oh, man. Someone's missing their time at the beach. Now I feel bad. You guys should go to the beach. Use your cell phone. It's only a warning. It's not going to cause. Well, we don't know, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so insular glion. Hold on a second. Someone said this is better than the beach. This is better than the beach. I, I mean, <laughs> I don't I don't know what to say about that. I don't think that's true. <laughs> Brain good, tumor bad on the merch. We absolutely can. Um, I may have to pay someone. <laughs> All right. So interrupts of synaptive intraoperative. I don't know what that is. Is that the operative microscope, the uh, exoscope you mean? Yeah, Hugh Defoe is the name of the doc. Imaging, uh, so ultrasound imaging doesn't go through the skull. You have to have the skull off. You have to go through the dura in order to get that. All right. Uh, I, I knew brain good, tumor bad would be good. <laughs> and yes, that's all you need from neurosurgery training, 100%. That and uh, measure twice, cut once. You can imagine the alternative. So yes, um, when brains reorganize due to the tumor, is this neuroplasticity? Absolutely. And it turns out that, you know, cortical regions are important, um, but networks are probably equally as important and maybe more so. And so your brain, even though it can't regenerate, can um, restructure its functional networks. And so with time and training, uh, you can actually accommodate uh, changes. And so this is what Defoe works on. It's, ex it's extremely complex. Um, he's extremely interested, interesting. And one thing that we haven't done in this uh, seminar series yet, and maybe worth it, is obviously touch on simple anatomy, which the med students said no we're going to do in the last week. But in addition to your simple cortical anatomy, there are white matter tract anatomy. And this has become a very big deal in neurosurgery because white matter tracts are where axons travel, right? And those are, your, those are you know, the, the highway system for your neural networks. And the networks are constantly interacting with each other. So it's a huge component of what we do. And, re and understanding those pathways and understanding that anatomy enables us to push the limits of surgery um, more and more. How does the, does the blood-brain barrier affect low granulomas? So blood-brain barrier, again, is there constantly. In glioblastomas, when you get this microvascular proliferation, the uh, endothelial cells separate a little bit, they become abnormal and it becomes leaky. In low-grade gliomas, they don't really have vascular proliferation to the extent that a high-grade glioma does. And so the blood-brain barrier is still intact. In addition, in glioblastoma, that vascular proliferation is only within that region that's contrast enhancing, which is how contrast works, right? And so those two centimeters beyond where most tumors, 95% of tumors recur, they have a normal blood-brain barrier. And that's why intraarterial chemotherapy makes so much sense, where now you can actually expand your region of treatment, right? And so, you know, in, in brain tumor surgery, in glioblastoma in particular, extent of resection has been a long time argued thing. And it's mainly because no one's gonna do a randomized clinical trial and randomize people to not get the extent of, the greatest extent of resection. Um, it's just never gonna happen, right? It's ethically wrong. And so we have to base this on retrospective or prospective studies when we're doing this. Um, I think that the real answer down the road is not extent of resection as much as extent of treatment, all right? And so we have to not only remove the tumor, but we have to treat the entire brain to get these little splinter cells that I talked about, the cells that migrate away. And that's how we have to, and then we have to also tailor our treatment to what those cells could be like in their, their environment that they're in. And so 
you know, in my training, I did a lot of work on something called convection enhanced delivery, which um, Bookfar talked about probably in his talk. And that's a procedure where we place a catheter near the tumor uh, or near the resection cavity. And we actually pump chemotherapy into the brain parenchyma. And using principles of something called bulk flow, which is a positive pressure push of chemotherapy, it seeps through the extracellular matrix and reaches a large, you know, region of, of peritumoral um, cells. Intraarterial makes a ton of sense because everything's got an arterial supply. And so you can treat a huge region of the brain and relatively safely. Do you have to have an extra background in genetics to help you understand the tumors? No. Um, I think that, you know, the, the importance of neurosurgeons for research is that we have access to the human brain. And, you know, you could do a glioma model in a mouse, but the truth is, is it's never going to closely enough approximate what happens in the human brain. And mice don't spontaneously get glioblastomas, you know, humans do. And so we have access to the brain. And then the whole thing, just like everything we've tried to instill here and just like everything you've seen through Lennox Hill is a team-based approach, right? You use people um, with expertise in different areas and you all come together and create something and, and contribute where you can. And so it, for treating for treatment purposes, you actually, I mean, it, it helps to understand these things and you need to stay on top of it. I think that most people who are interested in these types of tumors become sort of obsessed with this because the answer somewhere, the answer to fixing this is somewhere within the, you know, the, the genetics of these tumors, the DNA. And so by getting a better understanding of every moment of, you know, the pathogenesis of these things, you get a better chance of actually uh, finding, finding the silver bullet that we're all looking for. So yes, uh, concomitant fluorescence with intraoperative MRI, um, people have been looking at that and the studies are very good. Uh, and basically it's the same thing. You go to the MRI and you find a little bit of residual tumor and then you come back to the OR table and use the fluorescent dye to show you exactly where it is. So absolutely. Brain turns on the beach is coming next season, <laughs> next year. All right, let me keep going with the video. We'll take a break. I'm gonna answer more questions soon. We're at 1045 now. Can you guys hear the sound on this? Do you guys hear the sound or no? No sound? Yes. No, Who did? Who sound. said yes? Cannot hear the sound. I did, you, even... can't, you can't hear the sound. All right, that's better. Let's not have any sound. I'm gonna talk to you guys through it. So the main thing here is again, we look at our imaging, all right? And so we've got a non-enhancing T2 positive. I'm gonna tell you it's not enhancing. We don't have the enhancing images, but you know, flare positive T2 hyper intense lesion in the right uh, parietal lobe. And so uh, what we look for here, it's a little bit tough just based on this cup, but we want to know where this is relative to the motor strip or where it is relative to sensory cortex, all right? And you can tell a lot of that from preoperative MRI. But the other thing we want to do is make sure uh, that gives us a sense of whether or not we need monitoring in our case, or can we take this from a relatively non-eloquent region? This is abutting the primary motor strip. And so this is, a, this is a case where you would absolutely either do it awake or you would do it with motor mapping, basically. So you know exactly where the motor strip is so you stay away from it. All right, this is a case of Dr. Langer's. This little white spot in the middle of it, um, this case was actually previously biopsied. And so this happens a lot. Uh, actually, Dr. Bokbar and I were talking about this this morning where um, complex cases uh, get treated elsewhere with just a biopsy. Um, and they come to us for more, you know, a more definitive or a second opinion. And here, you know, we're comfortable to actually offer more and, and proceed with a, you know, a more uh, intense resection or a more aggressive resection. Someone just asked, why is the right side actually the left side? Um, the way to look at MRIs, and I apologize if no one has talked to you guys about this, especially this is, so the first thing you want to know is, is it axial, sagittal, or coronal, right? This is an axial image, meaning it's going through this way, right? Through the head. Sagittal would be uh, like Sagittarius, right? From the side. Coronal is like a crown. You're cutting through like a crown. And the way to think about this is the patient is laying on their back and you're looking through their feet, all right? And so every axial slice is a move towards their feet, basically from the top of their head. So the right side is over here, left side's over here, all right? Now let's keep going here. So this uh, is a case where basically we would use navigation to plan our incision, our craniotomy, okay? The incision would be just localized right over the center of the tumor. The bone flap that we would take off would be about a centimeter past the margins of our tumor. And again, with the bone still in place, navigation gives us one millimeter accuracy, even less than, right? Super precise. So we can tailor the bone flap to be just over that. 
Um, and another, you know, essential piece of Randy advice, um, all exposed brain will be violated. So you really don't want to show normal brain, all right? Um, there's risk to it. It dries out. There's instruments passing over and around it. So you really want to tailor your craniotomy to be over the lesion, all right? Um, the next thing we would do here is I would probably have ultrasound in a case like this, because even though this is a very well circumscribed probable low-grade glioma, these are infiltrative lesions, you know? And so you can see here, it gets a little fuzzy around the borders. Ultrasound here is gonna give you a gross approximation, number one, to make sure you're over the tumor, your navigation didn't get wrong or anything like that. But it's also gonna help you initially demarcate the, where the lesion is. This is not a case where we would use 5-ALA. Um, you could try it. Uh, but again, the evidence in lower grade lesions is not very good. I'll tell you the reason to use it in a case like this, I tend to use it always just for my own sake and edification of, of what it does. The reason you use it is because of the heterogeneity of these tumors. So this looks like a, a grade two glioma to me. Again, we won't know until we have a tissue diagnosis. But the key here is that maybe a region right here is higher grade. And again, that's gonna change our treatment. We don't wanna under treat these people. And so there have been a few studies that show that um, biopsying regions of positive fluorescence in a lower grade tumor will help diagnose higher grade regions and therefore better treat the patient. So that's important to understand. All right, I'm gonna let this play a little bit uh, without sound so you guys can see. So this is actually the brain. Uh, this is where the brain tumor is obviously. And this is a Dr. Langer case. And what he's doing here is cauterizing the PIA. Remember the uh, PIA is part of the, um, the meninges. It's adherent to the brain. And that's where the blood vessels tend to lay. And so you cauterize it and you cut it and now what he's doing is something called a subpeel dissection, meaning that he's just taking the tumor basically off that covering of the brain. And when you do a subpeel dissection, you actually respect anatomic boundaries um, to some degree. That's a little bit of bleeding from the capillaries. Again, the blood vessels run there. And what you're going to see he does is actually, you know, almost bluntly, there's no real cautery here at the tumor edge, using suction and blunt dissection to kind of find, you know, the, there's a gliotic plane around these things. The brain doesn't like them for the most part and to stay just around the tumor. And you can see there's preservation of this vein. This vein is critically important. If you take veins, you end up with strokes. If you take arteries like this one up here, you end up with strokes, so super important. Here, and I apologize, the color's a little off, but you can see there's a color difference here with the tumor. It's a little more like, uh, Dr. Bufar always says it looks like snot. And so it's a little bit snotty. And so you're able to suck it down, dissect the plane of the tumor there. All right, and again, this is a blunt dissector. This is a bipolar cautery just taking any feeding blood vessels. And you can see now they've gone basically circumferentially around it. And now what happens at the depth here? So I'm gonna pause it for one more second. So you have gyri and you have sulci, right? At the bottom of every sulci, there is something called U fibers, which are white matter tracks that go from gyrus to gyrus, all right? They're part of these communication pathways. And this is critically important. So a world famous neurosurgeon uh, named Yasser Gill, who was, you know, basically the founder of modern micro, you know, microsurgery, used to believe that if you did an anatomic resection on these, you would cure them. But the truth is, is that you can't. And the reason is because these U fibers, they're white matter tracks. Remember, these cells travel in the white matter. So not just at the depth of the lesion where you're going to hit the big white matter bundles that are traversing the frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal lobe that are all mixing together go to the corpus callosum through the cortical spinal tract. But you're also gonna hit these U fibers where tumor cells are gonna be in the gyrus next to it. So an anatomic resection helps without a doubt, but it's, it's not absolute. Now this is an instrument, I don't know if you guys have seen this, this is called a Cavitron. This is an ultrasonic aspirator. And so it's actually using ultrasound to disrupt the tissue and it's got a suction unit on there and it's sucking it up as it goes. All right. I have about five minutes, so I'm gonna to try to move through here a little bit more. All right, ultrasonic aspirator. So here at the depths, yeah, that tissue is a little bit whiter. Now you're closer to these white matter tracks at the bottom here. All right, you can see how this just separates the tissue right there. And that's the bulk of it coming out. And now typically what you do at this point, once the actual bulk of the tumor comes out, is you want to take your ultrasound again and make sure you got everything that you're supposed to get. Don't put it back in like they did. That's for visual effects. And then uh, again, confirm with your navigation that you're at the boundaries. And you can see here some more blunt dissection at the bottom. You know, uh, one thing actually to notice here, this is a little shinier than down here. This is white matter. This is more kind of uh, 
cerebral cortex, probably more tumor here. This is the sulci. And so this is the PIA as it dives into the sulci there. So that's a peel boundary. That's a safe boundary, anatomic boundary. Again, at the depths, the tumor cells do go underneath, but at that boundary, at least superficially, you know that you've reached your boundary. And so at any moment, we're using a combination of different ways to know that we've reached kind of where the end of the tumor is and where the normal brain begins, trying to stick with uh, brain good tumor vet. But anyway, so we'll move this along a little bit longer here. That's our navigation confirming they're achieving hemostasis here within the wound using cotton patties and uh, usually something called flow seal or surgicel. Move through here, taking out a little bit of residual areas of tumor. This is another peel boundary. So now there's PIA, there's PIA. So we know we've reached the anatomic limits at these regions. And they're just taking this a little bit farther forward in a sub peel dissection, All right? This is the wand I was talking about, confirming that we've reached the anatomic or the radiographic extent of our resection, okay? And then that's the hemostatic material. Let's see. Uh, now here's the ECOG component of this. So this is a stimulating probe and these are recording electrodes. And he's actually identifying where the motor strip is by stimulating. Um, and then so these can actually be stimulating electrodes also and sending transmission to the rest of the body that's being monitored so they can tell exactly where the motor strip was versus everywhere else. So this is obviously not an awake surgery. Like I said, I'm gonna find you guys an awake one. But this is uh, critically important to show that the motor function here, we were able to get you know, right up to it, but it still remains intact. This is hemostatic material. Again, they're gonna start closing now, so we're pretty much done. Then you reapproximate the dura with some stitches. You put the bone back on, and this is our post-op here. You can see this was a pre-op flare image. So again, flare bright, this is the old biopsy site. And this is a post-op image. And you can see that's a blood vessel on the front. This is probably just hemostatic material in the back and you know, it's gross total resection. And so, oh, you know what, actually here, these big white bundles, this is an area called the corona radiata. These are these white matter tracks I'm talking about. Huge, huge communication pathways, highway systems for information. And this is where we lose these tumors. This is where the treatment needs to be in these big white matter tracks. And so that's kind of where the future of this is. And that's why we need people like you guys um, getting interested and you know, trying to, to change what we do here and trying to advance it in some significant way. And so I think I'm out of time, but uh, let's at least take a few more questions. All right, what do I got? Josh, throw some stuff at me. Josh, help me out. You got this. <laughs> See what we can find. All right, bone marrow transplant. Not really a brain tumor treatment. Bone marrow transplants are important for other types of cancer, but not really brain tumors. Um, in general, we use uh, bone tra marrow transplant for things like myeloma, stuff like that, but not, not really brain tumor, not primary brain tumors anyway. So where else? Different sutures for different layers of the brain. Yes, surgeon preference for the most part. We don't really sew in the brain. You can do peel stitches sometimes when you're doing microvascular and anastomoses, but it's not a really common thing, meaning where you sew actual blood vessels to the brain. Would a patient remember being awake during surgery? Absolutely. Um, they are very much aware and awake. Uh, we do give some, um, you know, anesthesia has three components, right? Analgesia and amnesia are two of those components. So the amnesia component is important, but typically they do awake. Can mass spec detect cancerous cells in real time? Mass spec is going to be difficult because the resolution is not cellular, right? It's going to be a large, you have to, it's typically a one uh, centimeter cube that you look at. And so even within that, there's heterogeneity. I'll try to get Risto Philippi to talk a little bit about um, the novel kind of protocols we're using on, on advanced imaging for brain tumors. Does the brain fill the gap left by the tumor? To some degree, uh, it depends. So a thing like a meningioma that pushes normal brain out of the way, that'll come back. But remember, these are intrinsic primary brain tumors. So when we remove a section of that area, it's gone. That brain is gone, all right? And that's why when these things arise in really critical portions or real critical locations, can't really take that out. Can hemostatic material cause infection? Anything that is not natural to your body can cause an infection. Anytime you open the skin, it can. In general, we're fortunate because the scalp is very vascularized. And so scalp infections are very, very rare. But if it gets contaminated, it can get infected. How long does it take to take out a glioma? It depends on the glioma. Uh, if you're doing awake language mapping in the insula, 
uh, you're talking a multiple hour case, probably four hour case, five hour case. Um, typically you want the awake portion to be short because people have to tolerate this, right? We have them positioned. Remember it's microsurgery. So their heads are in pins it's called the Mayfield pin system. It's usually three pins. Sometimes Langer uses something called a Sugita, which is multiple pins. And so you anesthetize this, you use local anesthetic, but it, it's not, you know, the nicest feeling when you wake up or if you try to move. So generally you want this to be short so that the anesthesia lasts. How long is recovery? Uh, people are technically probably safe to go home the one day after neurosurgery, after brain surgery, as long as they have no neurologic deficits. And so um, the actual procedure itself, I would say typically it's about a three hour procedure. That would be the average, but different tumors vary. And then they go home, you know, typically we send people post up day two. Everyone spends one night in the ICU for very close observation. The majority of complications, um, are gonna happen within the first six to eight hours after surgery. So that's really the critical, critical time point. Initial voltage and current of ogemin stimulators varies depending on what you're gonna do and whether you're awake or you're asleep. So if you want more information on that, um, there's tons of uh, research articles and papers about what, what different institutions to use. What is the best tool we have during surgery to differentiate between tumor and healthy tissue? Um, well, that's kind of the crux of the issue, right? It's very difficult um, and there is no best tool. And so we use a bunch of different tools as well as our own experience. Home care after surgery, we try to live a normal life. There's not much. We tell people no bending, lifting, twisting. You don't wanna pop your stitches out. Um, we let people wash their hair day one for the most part. I actually don't even use staples anymore. I, I try to close the skin without any staples and I don't cut any hair. So cosmetically, it looks like you didn't even have a surgery. What kind of complications do you see? So in the first six to eight hours, the big complications are gonna be bleeding and stroke, okay? Um, bleeding is always possible. You have a blood vessel that doesn't have a, you know, a sufficient clot in it and it can bleed afterwards. Stroke can happen for a lot of reasons. It can happen from swelling, it can happen from sacrifice of an artery and then low blood pressure where there's no uh, perfusion from other you know, contributing arteries. It can happen from venous infarcts as well. So if you take a vein, remember blood comes in, blood goes out. If you stop the blood going out, blood, the pressure builds up in that region that's supplied by the artery and that brain tissue actually dies. Hydrogen peroxide cotton balls. This is, it's like an atomic bomb. So it actually doesn't really do anything about uh, infection, but it actually stops bleeding. It's an old school technique. It's probably like 25 years old. So you kind of soak, um, you know, 10% hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide and you just lay it in there and it just all bubbles up. It actually doesn't affect uh, the brain too much. What else do we have? Best tools, longest recovery. I think we're up on time. Is our next group in, Josh? Yep, I'm gonna promote him now. Great. Listen, guys, this is fantastic. Um, I'm around all the time. You guys can always ask me as many questions as you want. We have a lot more neuro-oncology lectures coming up, so stay tuned. And uh, we're going to start getting to some more obscure brain tumors and whatnot, also now that you guys are super experts. Um, remind me, Josh, later. We'll try to get